my mama was right. When I was a kid, when I was a teenager living at home, mom was reading some, a series of books on the Plantagenets. I had to look that up on Google and listen to the pronunciation before I could say that word to you. The Plantagenets were a ruling family in England during a certain time period. And there was a series of books on them, and mom found them fascinating. And I being a snob, I, I was more into the science. And besides, I was in high school. The history teacher was the football coach. He hated, 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 hated teaching history. And we hated, hated, hated being in his class. And we were all just mutually miserable. And I had a bad feeling about history that preceded that experience. So I just couldn't get it. But mom said, when you're in college, they tell you who is having sex with whom. And it gets a whole lot more interesting. I thought, oh, okay, well, that works. <laughs> so with that note as an introduction to catch your attention, who's having sex with whom, we're going to talk about something that is not explicitly <laughs> about sex. We're going to talk about your relationship with your muse. You may have many muses, but we're going to talk about a specific muse as an example. And this is a surprisingly sexual tension, sexual energy relationship, not sexual per se. And the muse was Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli, who was the prime minister in England twice, two separate occasions, under Queen Victoria. So as it happens when there's a change of power in the two houses in England, I'm just learning to speak about those because my history knowledge is, as you can imagine, scant. Once a party moves into power, then the queen or king calls them into a presence and directs the leader of that particular party to form a government. The reason that we're studying Benjamin Disraeli as a muse is that when we think in conversation about somebody being a muse for somebody else, it is so easy and so often that we just tend to go into a sexual mindset about it. Like she is not only his muse, but his mistress. And honestly, the muses that I'm going to talk about most of the time were indeed the lovers or the mistresses or sometimes the wives of specific well-known individuals. For example, the first YouTube that we put out in this muse series was about Aspasia, Aspasia being the muse, definitely the muse for Socrates, and I'm pretty sure she was never his lover. If it was, it was very, very, very early. But she was the mistress and later the wife. I'm not too sure if they were able to formalize uh, laws being what they were in Athens at the time. She was definitely the lover and then the common law wife of the Athenian general Pericles. And I talked about the relationship between Aspasia and Socrates, and we'll pick up later with Aspasia and Pericles. And to get us away from the mindset that all muse and muse devotional relationships involve sex, we're going to talk about one that doesn't. Here's a little thing to stick into the back of our minds. If you read Napoleon Hill's books, and I'm sure you have, you're being the kind of success-oriented person that you are, you read all the classic literature on how to be successful. So, of course, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich is likely on your bedside table, along with Sun Tzu's The Art of War and a few other choice books that I'm sure we have in common. When you read Napoleon Hill, in every single one of his books, he's got a, a chapter on sexual energy transmutation. So this is why you don't have to have sex per se, but there is a sexual energy component in all successful muse and muse, let's go, I just am picking a word for right now, I don't know if we'll keep it, but muse devotee uh, relations. And for Disraeli and Queen Victoria, I've got a couple of books that I've been reading, which I will select tidbits over time to inform myself and give you little vignettes. And here's the first one. Let me move it close to the center. The Lion and the Unicorn. The Lion was Gladstone, and the Unicorn is Disraeli. And then we've got this massive tome by Weintraum on Disraeli. And I've got another book coming in, and that's on Victoria, Queen Victoria, and Israeli. So we're going to have some useful material to, to feed this discussion. We'll just have a quick snippet as to why we're interested, and then we'll expand the notion to give you some thoughts to work with for the rest of the day. So Disraeli was twice in his life the prime minister for England, and on those occasions he would make weekly reports to the queen. 
Now, the queen at that time, just get to the bottom line here, she was depressed, okay? Her husband, Prince Albert, whom she adored, she loved him so much, he had recently died. She was in mourning. Her kids, you know, she had many children, and they were all getting older. They were leaving the nest, so it was, it was empty nest syndrome on top of the loss of her most beloved husband. She was menopausal. I mean, she was, she was putting it on in terms of a little bit of weight. She was pudgy. She was wearing black to express her mourning. I mean, she was a depressed woman. Gladstone, for example, when he would come in, would give her this very stern and officious report. When Disraeli became the prime minister, he courted her. He addressed her as my fairy queen. And he spoke to this hidden romantic side of her that she'd kept locked away from everybody, perhaps even somewhat from the prince. Who knows? I'll be finding out a bit more myself as I get the books that describe the relationship between Disraeli and Queen Victoria in a bit more, but he enlivened her with romanticism and he elevated her. He elevated her concept of herself to be the fairy queen, not just a staid old monarch of England, but not a happy lady. Disraeli was a bit of a prolific author. When he was not active in politics, he was writing books, sometimes the two simultaneously, and ooh, he could wield a wicked pen. Oh, he could be vicious. And the queen had also authored a book, maybe two, of poetry. So on one occasion, he presented her with a collection of his volumes. She very graciously gave him a copy of her own little volume on poetry. And thereafter, with this little wink and nod, he would say, we authors, when talking to her in reference to other people who are not so endowed with intellectual creativity. He had a gift for making her life lighter, brighter, much more rich and full. There was something that she wanted. She was queen, but she wanted to be empress. In fact, the notion that her daughter, the daughter was married to royalty in Europe and was in line to become an empress there. That was just the title that she was due to assume when her husband became emperor. And the queen was just a little tiny bit peeved that her daughter would become empress where she was merely queen. Disraeli was the one who arranged for Queen Victoria to also become Empress of India. And thereafter, she signed her letters Victoria, R and I, as in Regina, standing for her rulership as Queen of England, but also Imperatrix as the Empress of India. Disraeli elevated her. He brought out the fantasy side, the embellished side of her rulership, and she also elevated him. He was born a commoner, and not poor, but not super wealthy. She made it possible for him to become a peer of the realm. He became a lord, and he moved from the House of Commons to the House of Lords. All sorts of wonderful things went on, including the fact that Disraeli was the figure who truly enhanced England's rulership on a worldwide basis. You and I, I'm not the Queen of England. You are likely not Benjamin Disraeli, Prime Minister of England. And together, we may wind up working together, but we're not talking about that today. We're talking about you and your relationship with whatever muses you have in your life, because I'm willing to bet that you have several, not just one, but several. And so we're going to talk about the progression in this day and age of how we identify and cultivate relationships with our various muses. So the first thing is, You open up their emails. (laughs) And it sounds so silly, but, you know, most professional muses these days are choosing this as it's a vocation. It's like we cannot stop being a muse. We have a compulsion to teach. We have a compulsion to elevate others. And one of the ways that we can do it is we create those email. We set up the website. We have the opt-in forms. We collect email addresses and we send out emails. And the top muses on my list send out emails. Another thing that we do, (laughs) this is so obvious, this is so straightforward, but we create YouTubes. And you'll know who your muses are by 
who's on your YouTube feed? Who do you regularly, consistently turn to? And maybe you don't even listen to them all the way through, but you certainly tap into them every single time. And you've identified that this is a person whose input I'm willing to give my attention to. Those are the easiest, gentlest, first steps in cultivating a relationship. The fact that you actually let them have access to your email box, it's huge. It's a big thing. You may actually subscribe to somebody or you'll give them a like or you go to LinkedIn, you see that they've posted. If you're really feeling generous and profoundly moved, you may actually repost and share some thoughts or you may even just give them a like, a comment. Any of those are tokens of beginning your relationship. Next step, because we're only going to go through the preliminary steps today, is you buy their book. I would show the book that I've got by Perry Marshall at you right now. I'm just going to have to give you a screenshot. Amanda Francis is another of my muses. I have her book. I tell you, I made a special trip to the post office to pick that up when that book came in. And I read it, you know, not only cover to cover, but I would sort of pot shot read many, many times. I ultimately gave it to a friend and I gave her one of my copies of Perry Marshall's book, 8020 Marketing. Having multiple copies of a book is a clear sign that that person is one of your muses. Giving away that book, it's like, hey, you're starting a new business, let me support you. Here's a copy of this book, here's a copy of that book. You know you can replenish your stash later and we often do, of course we do. I'm going to get another copy of Amanda Francis, I'll get another copy of Perry Marshall's 8020 just so I have another one around the house in a different location because that's how we are with our muses. We buy their books, we give their books away. Another person who is a muse for me is Alice Alicia Jones. She was my Reiki teacher. I uh, try periodically (laughs) to attend her early Sunday morning Reiki group sessions. And she is the author of a book that I helped edit for her called Own Your Power Day by Day, 365 little micro lessons, like two pages per day, easy to read. She was very much guided by her guides in the development of this book. At one point, I was buying a copy of her book every month and having her send it to somebody on my gift list. So the people whose books you not only buy for yourself, but you gift to others, absolute sure sign that that person is one of your muses. Here's one more little clue about how you identify the people that are your dominant muses in your life. And that is, they elevate you or they lift you up or they transform you. I know transformation is one of those chat GPT terms. We try to stay away from it. But mm, when it comes to the muse relationship, that is the word. So they transform you in an area where you are weak, where you know that you're really trying to make a shift and you're looking for the help. So this is Muse territory. So when I pay attention to Perry Marshall, now that here at Themesis, we've launched our first round of products. We have the salon going on every month. We've got the first short course. We've got Muse opportunities, meaning you can interact with me. I need business guidance. So I reach out to Perry Marshall. I've been a subscriber in the lowest tier of his membership group for, gosh, six, seven years. Amanda Francis. She's somebody whose YouTubes I pay attention to religiously and the same to her emails. I look to Alicia, Alice Alicia Jones, for spiritual and energy work. As I mentioned, she's a Reiki teacher. When I was developing all the mathematical concepts that we're now releasing to you as the Corticon, it's an invention and it's a core engine for AGI, artificial general intelligence. But during the development stage, which was about 10 years, I was way, way far in the back end of a tunnel, just being very meditative and very introverted, hugely introverted. My social skills went down. So one of my my other current muses is Cindy Sophia. She brands herself as a coach for affluent, rich, and wealthy romance, if I'm saying it right, something to that effect. She has a book out on the subject. It's just a little book, but it's useful. And I'm not looking at it for romance. I'm looking up for social guidance because my social skills have gotten weak and I need coaching there. You find your muses and you pay attention to your muses in the area where you need the most substantive evolution. And then you pay attention first to areas where your muses are giving you free or inexpensive content. Their emails, their YouTubes, whatever books they have for sale. 
So those are the starter steps. And when you notice yourself paying attention to your muses, then you start saying, okay, now do I need to take this relationship a little bit further, which we can discuss in another vid. We've gotten enough in for today. Thank you so much. It's been lovely to have a moment with you. I'm Aliana Moran, founder and chief scientist with Themesis, founder of the Themesis Academy, and potentially at some point, your muse. To get regular emails from us so that you learn all about opportunities to work with your muse or anything else that we offer at Themesis, salons, short courses, and the like, particularly to be informed of flash sales, which we don't announce on YouTube, just to those who've opted in with us at Themesis. Please go to Themesis, go to the About page, scroll down, fill in that opt-in form and confirm. And please move the emails from Themesis to your preferred email folder. We're going to so much enjoy connecting with you. Thank you. Have a lovely day.